Welcome to our very first episode of this new series I'm starting, where we interview the best people in the Amazon space. Today, we're joined by Keith. Keith is the director of marketplaces at Made & Cookware, where he manages eight figures of annual sales on Amazon and Walmart. Before that, he launched a 3PL account for Ashley Furniture, one of the world's largest furniture brands, and he even started his own Amazon brand back in 2017. Keith, I'm super excited to have you on. Thank you for joining us today. No, I appreciate the invite, and I'm uh, honored to be the first guest on the podcast, so excited for today. Awesome. Keith, I just want to start by giving a bit of context here. Can you tell our listeners how you got into the Amazon space and what you're doing today? Yeah, so I started back, so I, well, I guess let me preface. I've been selling on marketplaces for over 20 years, started on eBay in the early 2000s, met a friend uh, in 2016 who was selling on Amazon, ended up kind of... Uh, being familiar with marketplaces, starting my own brand in 2017, ended up wrapping that up in late 2021. Uh, but before I wrapped it up, I ended up uh, kind of doing a career switch. So I used to be an engineer, uh, ended up working at an agency and then went to the brand side. So I worked for Veridesk, worked for Ashley Furniture, and now I'm at Made in Cookware. Right. So can you tell us a bit more about what you do at Made in Cookware and maybe what the marketplace situation was like when you first joined? Yeah, so they had only been on Amazon for about three months. Uh, so I was hired in as the director of marketplaces. Um, but being the, the only team member back when I, I got hired on, I was kind of a, a jack of all trades, really expanded their Amazon presence, got them started with advertising, kind of took that first year to, to build up the account, see what potential was there. Uh, really did everything myself. Now in year two, we've kind of scaled to the point where I've hired a team for catalog and merchandising. Right. I'm still in the weeds a little bit, but we're still scaling up the account to its full potential. So, Right. So I'm super curious, actually, how do you go about launching a new brand in a super competitive category like cookware? Well, Maiden, um, I was fortunate there's a lot of brain equity there. So Maiden is uh, up, in, up and coming. Uh, household name in the space of cookware. So there's already a lot of branded demand there. Um, so what I, I recommend, I guess, for anybody launching new to Amazon is really see what that, if there's any branded demand there at first, see what those metrics are, run branded for the first three to four months, see what your run rate is, see what your, your advertising is going to be, see what your total advertising cost of sale is going to be, make sure the margins and the metrics work and then scale the non-brand. So that's exactly what I did for Maiden. I leaned, which is the easy thing to do, I leaned in on branded first, saw what the, what those metrics were gonna be, and then said, okay, if, we, if we're at X and we wanna get the Z, here's what we need to do in non-branded sales for Y to meet that. Right, that makes sense. Can you give us an idea of what the metrics you're looking at are during that first year or two? Yeah, um, so of course, ROAS, uh, TACO, so total advertising cost of sale, understanding unit economics by SKU. So most people only look at kind of a blended approach. Um, I look at look at the economics by SKU to make sure I'm not running negative on any advertising. I look at TACOs by SKU, ROAS by SKU, and of course, top line and bottom line. Sure, are you looking at market size, market share, competition? I, I, I am. Um, so I'm looking at it from, you know, Maiden is a premium brand, premium pricing. I am looking at overall category, but what I'm really focused in on is what our, our space is, like what our, our available and obtainable market is based on our price point. We, you know, we're, we sell $100 plus frying pans. We're probably not going to appeal to the person that that needs a $15 frying pan. Like that's a totally different market. I get it. But we're kind of in this fortunate space where cookware is both a need-based product and a want-based. So everyone needs cookware, right? Like you need to cook. Of course. Uh, but we have a high percentage of people that need cookware that want high-quality cookware. Um, a lot of other categories, especially commodity commodity items that need-based percentage is way higher than the want-based percentage. Um, so that's where, you know, as a premium brand, offering premium product, we can really uh, succeed and take over quite a bit of the market. 
Right. And how do you actually determine though, like what that market size is? Like let's say Grover is a sixty million dollar a year category. That's probably like an underestimate. But let's say sixty million a year on Amazon. How do you know what percent of that is premium cookware? So there's a lot of different tools out there. I'm sure you're familiar with that, where you can see kind of revenue by SKU and kind of revenue for the category. I'm looking at price point. I'm looking at material. I'm looking at features. So if let's just say I don't know, cookware is a a hundred million dollar category. Your actual niche is going to be typically a percentage of a percentage of a percentage. You know, only a certain percent of that's going to be stainless. You know, a certain percent of that stainless is going to be a certain size. A certain percent of that size and stainless is going to have different features. So you might start at a hundred million, but by the time you narrow it down, the total market might be five to ten million. And then, of course, it's either going to be consolidated or fragmented with different competitors. And then you got to come up with a percentage that's realistic of what you can actually steal from competitors or gain. All right, that makes sense. So, are you just looking at the top ASINs, like for the word like steel frying pan, and assuming those make up a certain percentage of sales, kind of like the eighty twenty rule? And you, like, I guess, guess the market size based on that, or how does that actually work? Yeah, so a little bit of both. So if you're looking at like a cookware category, there are going to be top keywords, um, you know, like cookware set, frying pan, etc. But there's also a lot of branded demand that's raising the overall category that you have to take into consideration. So if someone's a fan of a particular brand and that brand maybe has 25% of that market, the percentage you can actually obtain from their branded search terms that's raising the overall market is going to be way less than a generic non-branded search term. Right. So keeping that in mind, how do you determine what percent of the market you can actually, I guess, acquire? (laughs) So uh, I can't go into, some of that's proprietary. I can't go into exact details, but generally, um, if it's a fragmented market, let's say there's five top competitors, you can generally get into that same percentage range that they have if you're offering the right product at the right price with the right quality. Right. And do you have like certain, I guess, time goals or money goals to get there? And how do you determine that, especially if you're like a newer brand? Uh, I mean, it's all based on your top line and bottom line goals. I mean, a lot of brands, I mean, that's going to vary so wildly. Um, but once you kind of max out on your market size, um, you're going to have to start looking at kind of lateral product expansion. So I wouldn't say there's necessarily a time goal. Like I've seen brands get to get to their total obtainable market within like a few months. And it's like all about expanding laterally. It just depends on like what their top line goals are, bottom line goals and like unit economics of their products. Right. I see. I can see you guys are outranking like 10, 20,000 review products on, you know, pretty broad keywords. I think um, you are ranked on like the keyword frying pan. So I'm just curious, like, how do you guys go about doing that? Well, so I'm a firm believer. I think the our product, our highest number of reviews at the parent level, I think, is around 900 today. I don't think it personally makes much difference between, you know, two or 300 reviews and two to 3000 reviews. I was fortunate that made in is such a well-known brand when I leaned in, when I leaned in on the branded side for just branded sales, I was able to acquire the reviews to go into non-branded. What I guess my stance on it is 10 to 20 reviews is going to have a much different conversion rate than 100 to 200 reviews but but going from 100 to 200 reviews and trying to chase that one or two thousand reviews is going to have much higher diminishing returns on conversion than sure. that one to two step for sure so let's say i have like a 700 review product and i'm in a category where the top sellers are like five ten fifteen thousand reviews what steps what I have to take to outrank them, or at least have a chance at outranking them? Well, uh, review score is one thing. Right. Review quality. Um, 
So generally, you know, we've been very fortunate that people that use cookware write some lengthy reviews. We're getting paragraphs instead of just sentences. So in general, if you have a high quality product that can command a longer and more quality review with a over with a higher overall review score. Now, like I don't think there's much difference between like a 4.7 and like a 4.6. You know, I, I don't think there's going to be hardly any conversion rate difference. You're just going to have to make it work um, based on the unit economics on what you can spend and what your conversion rate is. And then figuring out what conversion rate is needed to maintain profitability while scaling advertising. And naturally, you're just going to pull up an organic rank. Right. What does that look like, though, in terms of campaigns? Do you have like certain keywords put out into their own like single keyword campaigns and exact match? I know some people do that. Other people just keep them in their regular campaigns. What, what does the actual ad structure look like for a keyword yep. you're trying to for? So I do, well, I'm a huge believer. I do all campaign types. Um, I got everything from phrase, broad, exact. Exact match is where you're going to make most of your organic ranking naturally. Um, but if the if the economics don't work, I mean, a lot of categories, as you know, are 10 to $20 per click, and you got a, maybe an AOV of 30 bucks. Like the math will, will never work out there that's where you got to know the lifetime value and that's more of like supplements play you see that a lot there stuff with with high repeat purchases so understanding the math of the advertising with your conversion rate along with your lifetime value um, and then just doing the ad types that work for you i've seen i i recommend all ad types um just you know you see a lot of like people saying like catch all campaigns with like low bids broad phrase definitely do everything you can as long as it works all right i saw on one of your linkedin posts that you're actually a dsp fan if my memory serves me right i think you recommend people use around 10 percent of their budget for dsp a lot of people avoid dsp because of attribution issues other people would argue that dsp just attributes you know, sales that might have just happened anyways, especially if you had your end well, or if you have a lot of traffic that was going to purchase anyways. What's your stance on that, and why do you like DSP? Well, so I like DSP to an extent. Um, I mean, there is value in views retargeting, competitor views retargeting. Like, I, that's pretty well known in the space. You know, like there's a magic number of views retargeting that naturally leads to car, less car abandonment. Um, where I'm not, like you kind of said, because it is views-based attribution, you can spin endlessly into it. Uh, and you're just unnaturally boosting your ROAS, your ad attributed sales, it's gonna skyrocket. The, you know, and the same thing with sponsored display, if you're doing the, v, the VCPM, the view CPM, take what your search budget is, take five or 10% of that, and limit your DSP retargeting or your sponsored display retargeting to that percentage. Yes, there might be some wasted ad spend, but you, at least you're limiting it to five or ten percent. But there is value in views retargeting. You just have to make yeah. it. You just have to know your your KPIs and and how that works. But I don't recommend just the overall spending indefinitely into it. All right, that does make sense. So how do you determine how much of the sales on the actual DSP dashboard are real and how much of them are, you know, misattribution? Obviously, it's a difficult question to answer. To answer. I've seen sponsored display campaigns attributing $800,000 of sales per month that weren't truly really happening, at least because of the ads, they were happening organically. We ended up switching birds off and nothing happened to the account. So how do you determine how much of the sales you see on that dashboard are real? Well, so with sponsored display, if you do CPC, uh, I feel a little bit better knowing there was an additional step of a click that led to a sale. Now, the AMC report uh, generally can kind of help with that, but there is some nuances to that as well. Is did those increased views and frequency truly lead to the sale? It's always going to be questionable. That's why I say limit it to a percentage, um, and then just measure if you had any lift from doing five or 
if you if your search budget's a hundred grand and you had X number of sales and you say, okay, let's spend five grand to DSP and your sales are still flat, probably didn't uh, do anything besides just increasing ad attributed sales. Right, for sure. I actually wanted to ask you about Walmart as well. I see you guys are listed on both marketplaces. What are like the biggest differences between the two and how are Walmart ads performing? So the ad platform is quite a bit different. Um, you can't do some of the negative targeting you can do. The, uh, of course, there's no sponsored brand stores on Walmart currently, so the SB ads are quite a bit different. Uh, I would say Walmart, it's they're making quite a bit of changes, um, but it's a much more, it's similar to how AMS was several years ago. Um, and then as far as targeting and just things you can do, um, there's a lot of opportunity for Walmart. It's obviously not as big of a marketplace, but a lot of the CPCs are cheaper to where you might be able to get 5, 10, 20% of your Amazon sales volume just on Walmart. That makes sense. Is the OS good though? A lot of people complain that the conversion rates on Walmart just aren't the same. For, uh, yeah, it probably depends on category and just depends what the CPCs are. Yeah. Uh, what does it uh, cost like in comparison to Amazon? I've seen anywhere from 20 to 50% cheaper. That's but good. Like you may, I mean, sometimes it can be a wash though if the conversion rate uh, is lower. Right. That does make sense. I was actually curious, how does zero to one differ for your own e-commerce brand where you're you know, on a limited budget, you don't have that many ASINs and you might not really have a brand yet? Um, compared to zero to one when you're launching a brand like Ashley Furniture or Made in Cookware? Uh, well, I, I mean, zero to one for a small brand with no real brand equity is going to be all new to brand customers. Um, scaling that's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a lot longer time period because, you know, at a one to two percent review rate per order, um, getting the 100 to 200 reviews is going to take months, if not years, uh, depending on what your product is. Where brands, um, in you know, well-known brands, where they have kind of a leg up is they're able to gain reviews just from their branded customers early on and go into new-to-brand, non-branded advertising at a much higher conversion rate that a smaller brand won't get until a year or two into it. Of course. And I saw that your own brand was launched in 2017. I'm just curious, like, how different was Amazon and PPC specifically back then? And, like, what type of results could you drive using PPC you know, six years ago? Yeah. yeah. So I remember, so I had, uh, I got brand registry in August of 2018. And I remember sponsored brand ad types back then, you could not pull a search term report. And because yeah. it was supposed to be like top of funnel, you, you had no idea what you're spinning into. It's a, it was a brand awareness play. And I can remember getting CPCs at 10 to 15 cents and getting pretty good row ads and just kind of being, being able to spend infinitely into that as long as my cash flow was there. And I remember I was the only one, uh, and I was going up against large brands like, uh, hundred, you know, nine figure brands and beating them with sponsored brand placements because you know the ad data wasn't there where none of the uh softwares would optimize or be able to optimize sponsored brand ads um of course i mean you know all that's changed um and with as amazon's given more data and more availability and more reports Brands, especially larger brands that naturally had a leg up are able to utilize that. And now they're just killing small brands. Um, it's much harder to start from zero now than back then. Back then, you know, a small brand could compete for a search term with 50 to 100,000 searches uh, and actually be profitable. Uh, now it's it's much harder. What was like a normal day cost back then? Well, I mean, 10 to 20%, I would say, was pretty standard. Now, I think most people are 30 to 50%. Yeah. 
Yeah, I saw a few posts actually. I haven't done this for our own accounts, but a few people have like a couple of thousand market bases connected. And all of them have said the average A cost is like 35% right now, which is yeah. why it's kind of funny when I get on calls with people. Like, say if my A cost is like 40%, I need it to like go down to 10% for me to make money. And I usually tell them it's not really going to happen just because, you know, this, those yeah. numbers don't exist outside of a few categories today. Yeah, mathematically, unless they have a time machine and can go back to 2017, 2018, uh, not mathematically possible. What, what was organic like? So, like, what percentage of your sales came from organic back then? Well, so back then, ad attributed sales, if your ad attributed sales were 20 to 25%, that was a little high. The number of ad placements, um, I mean, you had, I think, three search placements at the top. You had the old sponsored brand ads. You had like a mid placement sponsored brand ads and then like search ads kind of peppered. There was no uh, below the fold product targeting back then that you could control or any of that. Um, so it was way more, pro I mean, that was another reason why it was so much more profitable back then was if you had 20% added attributed sales Nowadays, I see anywhere from 30 to 70 percent. Um, right. And, you know, the higher number, 70 percent is not necessarily bad. It's just when 50 to 60 percent of the placements are advertising placements, it's just what's going to happen. Right. Of course, we have this new dashboard actually that we've been building where you can see like organic sales, like percentage ad sales, percentage organic and like the total numbers for the two. And I haven't pulled the data on like a sizable number of accounts or anything, but I think organic right now is 30, 40% for any like brand that doesn't sell supplements or toothpaste or something that's kind of replenishable. So yeah, it's, it's gotten a lot worse. What were margins back? Oh, sorry, what were margins like back then? I mean, that's going to just vary by uh, size. So I mean, I was a small... Uh small brand. I, I was only doing six figures. I wasn't doing anything crazy. So I didn't exactly have uh, leverage for lower cost of goods, but um, generally better. I mean, that's why you saw so many small uh, brands launch in 2017, 2018, and kind of make their exit over the last couple of years when the numbers no longer worked. Um, you saw a lot of people selling to aggregators over the last couple of years because they were just tired and they watched their kind of margins get diminished over the last, you know, four to five years. And nothing out of their control. It's just ad attributed sales go up, tacos goes up. Or sorry, tacos goes down. And uh, overall margins decrease. For sure. I speak to a lot of seven, eight, and sometimes nine figure sellers. And usually what I see is they're just people that launched 10 years ago. Right? Usually their listings aren't special. Um, the product itself is nothing crazy. Their campaigns usually aren't that good. You see a lot of people with like 500, 600 keyword campaigns, a lot of the campaign types not being utilized. A lot of these people just never turn sponsored brands on. For some reason, a lot of them aren't putting negatives. A lot of them don't use software. Most of them push their bids like once every couple of weeks. And usually what happens is there's like this smoke that gets built up, right? If you launched 10 years ago, in a category that's not that small and you know you did back then you know what was considered a decent amount of sales over time you just build up this crazy amount of reviews and you don't really have to do anything right the listing content could be bad the ads could be bad everything could be bad but you're ranked on some of the best keywords you have a lot of reviews and it's just going to be super super hard to displace you and that's kind of the archetype of most successful Amazon sellers I see, right? I haven't really seen anyone who's launched within the last two, three years outside of brands that exist off Amazon, whether like, you know, in retail or in DTC, I haven't seen anyone um, scale to eight figures actually in the last couple of years if they weren't, you know, at least launched in 2015, 2016. Well, I mean, you could launch 10 years ago too. That was the, the rare example where 10 years ago, you could take $10,000 and actually launch a brand uh, because the margins were so much higher. And then accounts had weekly payouts and daily payouts. And now the 
cash conversion cycle so long and bi-monthly payouts where you really need 100, 200,000 minimum to launch in a category yeah. and uh, people just aren't able to bootstrap the, the, that anymore. For sure. Especially since I think the hit rate of launches has actually gone down. I think there are too many options out there for most consumers and you know, most products that you'd want to launch, especially back in the day when you could just launch like an apple slicer from Alibaba. Most of that stuff doesn't work anymore. So the hit rate of launches, I believe right now is 30%, right? So it usually yeah. takes a lot of money to actually, I guess, get an ASIN that works out. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that I, I agree. Most of the brands, I don't personally know, know anybody that's launched since 2021 with a small brand that did not already exist outside of Amazon and scale it successfully. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. How do you decide though, which ASINs to turn off? I see you guys are going a lot harder, maybe like your five, six top ASINs for made and cookware. So I'm curious, like which ones do you know to scale and which ones you kind of figure out won't really work or aren't worth the effort? Um, so, I mean, I generally go by the 80, 20 rule. Um, and I feel like most brands do, I know lifetime value at the SKU level, um, combine that with unit economics at the SKU level. And I generally recommend knowing that for your catalog and then leaning heavy, heavily into those SKUs or ASINs that work, um, highest repeat purchase value, lowest return rates, highest margins. That's where you can scale. Right. When do you know, like, when to call it quits though? Because I see a lot of people that have products that just aren't working out. And a lot of people would like to blame the ads or blame, you know, whatever strategy they're using or their SEO or their listing content. But at the end of the day, most people just don't have good ASINs. So I'm curious, like, when do you know, um, or how do you know when to call it quits? I would say when the math no longer works, if you're tracking the math at a SKU level, of course, any new product launch is not going to do great because you just don't have the reviews. You don't have the organic ranking, but if you're tracking your KPIs weekly and then you're three or four months into it and that SKU, you know, high return rate, not profitable, I don't know, maybe 3.9 stars. You can see it's trending down reviews. It's probably time to pull back. Um, it doesn't mean getting rid of the product. Products can serve, can serve a role. It just means that you're not able to make that product work on Amazon for whatever reason. It could be competition, could be CPCs are too high. All right, that makes sense. So how would you go about analyzing a market, I guess, before jumping in and launching your own ASIN to kind of decrease the failure rate? Uh, I mean, generally you're, you're on Amazon, uh, I, I guess the best way to explain it on Amazon, you're just meeting demand, right? Very few people are actually creating demand and educating anybody. So if you're just meeting demand, you're looking at what searches are customers typing in, what are the actual sales numbers of the product types that are actually selling just because someone's searching pin doesn't mean that you know like premium pins are actually selling in the huge numbers you have to really analyze like okay is it blue ink versus black ink ballpoint right. versus gel so like know where the search term volume is know what's actually selling at like the product or material type and then use that to make your inform your decisions right. that makes sense and last question here, uh, Keith, you've been pretty good at increasing market share. And since Amazon is a zero sum game, you can't really grow without someone else shrinking because there's limited demand, there's limited search volume. It's the marketplace at the end of the day and every sale that's yours is taken from someone else. So how do you go about, or what actions do you take to increase your market share? What do you do that other people aren't doing to enable you to you know, take the sales that they would have otherwise had for themselves. Yeah. So really the easiest thing you can take away from competing brands is generic non-branded keywords. You know, I see a lot of people on LinkedIn posts like, Hey, you can conquest this competitor brand and take over their PDPs and their sponsor brand ad. 
in your sponsored display. And I see a lot of people making those recommendations to brands. And maybe that brand has like a half million dollar spend budget or whatever. Okay. Cool. And they're, they're going and pissing off somebody with 30 million in spend. Like that's probably not the best idea. <laughs> you know, you might not get on their radar immediately, but if you, steal enough market share and cause enough problems you will there's an generally you can grow a brand with new to brand generic search term customers that's what i recommend like i mean unless you're a giant brand and have the ability to go heads on sure but there's enough generic search terms for everybody to usually increase their market share without causing a war and causing damage right and what would you, I guess, do differently? Because, you know, a lot of people are advertising on those same generic terms. You know, you start off with 0% market share. What does going from 0 to 10 look like? Are you just bidding higher than other people? Are your prices just lower? You kind of get more of the market interested in what you're selling. How do you actually divert that revenue from your competitors to your own rent on those terms? Yeah, so knowing... I mean, everyone looks at first page mobile now, and then of course, first page desktop 48 placements versus 18 mobile, knowing your share of voice, uh, the product type. So if you're going after a certain keyword that's material based or, or generic or, or more granular, like knowing what percentage you own of organic placements and what percentage you own of paid placements. Um, it's not exact science because as you know, like, Ranking is depends on your zip code and geolocation. So there are a lot of tools out there that will give you a rough idea of share of voice. And if it's going off of one area, you can generally apply it to all locations in the United States. And then just kind of adjusting your bids based on like your share of voice and like what your goal is for that keyword. Right, that makes sense. Are you doing anything on the listing side of things, the pricing side of things, or are you kind of just looking how much of the search volume they're getting and just, you know, just think up or down based on that? Are you saying, uh, you saying like conversion rate optimization for listings? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like pricing or actual listing content, especially if you're newer, maybe your share of voice is like what, 3% or under? Like, what yep. does. One do I guess to get that up besides increasing their bids? Well, if you're a brand, you're generally going to have to follow, you know, map pricing. If you have adjustability in pricing, I mean, the, the lower lower the prices, the naturally the more volume you're going to have. If you don't have that flexibility to change pricing, or if you're you're stuck on very strict brand guidelines, then I always just the generic A plus content listing optimizations that's naturally going to lift your conversion rate yeah. um, conversion rate optimization is not necessarily filling in content but if you don't have any content there filling it in is naturally going to boost your conversion generally and then you can run continuous a b test um, just in seller central for all your copy your images um, and then there's third party A B test software for pricing that exists if you're if you have flexibility on that. I agree. I think changing your main images actually can be a massive, massive lever mover just because main images control indirectly the amount of traffic you're getting. Going from a zero point three percent CPR to zero point five percent is like what? Sixty percent more traffic, I believe, besides like the increase in organic ranking. That's going to happen as a result of that. So, uh, yeah. Well, I am, I have kind of a controversial take on main image. Right. It depends on how much organic placements you have versus sponsored. I see a lot of people, like if you're in a high CPC environment and you're just trying to get people to click on, like they're searching a generic search term and they're just like, wow, what's up with that product? Let me click on it. And then you're paying this high CPC for a product that probably doesn't meet 80% of the market demand, all you're doing is just getting people that are curious to click on it that would never right. purchase it. Right. I mean, that that is fair. I mean, traffic only matters if it's higher quality and if you're not overpaying. So yeah, no, that is fair. In a world where you're paying like five, six, seven, ten 10 bucks a click, 
and maybe you're not ranked that well organically, I can see why having more traffic would actually hurt. But if, cool. if your product meets 80% of what that market demand is, and you got organic rank and sponsored rank for those top two keywords, yeah, drive drive those clicks. But the the CTR does is not always necessarily a good thing. Right, for sure. For sure. Obviously, it would depend what search terms you're showing up for. I, I think we did a pretty good job of giving people like a realistic view of what selling on Amazon is like today and some strategies for increasing market share. I had a lot of fun filming this. So thank you so much for joining us and for the rest of you. I'll see you guys next week. Appreciate it.